Welcome to the Ampl Amplify Race and Reality uh, in STEM series. It's hosted by uh, Gla the Gladstone Institutes in partnership with the University of Washington, Georgia Tech, uh, and the University of Texas at Austin. Um, this is a real honor and a treat uh, to be to participate in this and be a part of this conversation that's on the national national level. The Amplify uh, webinar series aims to give a national platform to speakers to have candid conversations around race and diversity in the STEM fields. It was launched in 2020 as part of Glassstone's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and is hosted in partnership with the institutions that uh, I have aforementioned. These conversations really sort of emerged out of a lot of the, the tension and strife, particularly uh, uh, after uh, George Floyd's murder uh, last, last May. Um, and there were many, many people, um, particularly in STEM, that there was a, a shutdown STEM uh, event that took place in June of last year. And many people in STEM were just kind of pondering, wondering, and curious, what, it, what can we do? What can, how can we participate in transforming the culture and actually participating in uh, broadening represent representation and participation in STEM? And so this has uh, emerged and was spawned by that, by that movement. A few housekeeping uh, notes here. Uh, this event is currently being live streamed on Facebook and is also being recorded. Uh, you can submit questions anytime during the talk. Uh, by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll wait to the very end of the presentation in order to actually field questions. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook Live, submit your questions in the chat. Um, we will share them with the speaker. Uh, we, will, we will try to get through as many questions as we possibly can, but if we don't get to all the questions, you can reach out uh, after the webinar. So with that, uh, it is truly a pleasure and an honor to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Scott E. Page, who's at the University of Michigan. Scott is a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and a, uh, a fellowship at the Center for Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. He was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2011, and in 2019, he was awarded a Distinguished University Professorship from the University of Michigan, the university's highest academic honor. His research focuses on the function of diversity and complex social systems, the potential for collective intelligence, and the design of institutions for meeting the challenges of a complex world. He is the author of more than 100 research papers and five books, including the diversity bonus, covering a variety of fields, including game theory, economics, political theory, formal political science, sociology, psychology, philosophy, physics, public health, geography, uh, and a few, many, many more. Along with five other scholars, he has recently created a new academic journal of collective intelligence. I was, um, I had the privilege and honor of actually hearing Scott a few years ago at the National Society of Black Engineers National Convention, uh, and his, his seminar, his presentation was both riveting, uh, very compelling, and very, very thought provoking. Uh, and so it's with an honor that, that I introduce him today and I'll turn it over to you, Scott, uh, for you to share your wisdom with the rest of the attendees. Cameron, thank you so much. And it's great to be here and um, just fantastic to have this opportunity to talk to such a auspicious group of scientists. So what I wanna do is I just wanna walk through um, a little bit of thinking from a group of people who try to think about the role of diversity in terms of producing what we think of as collective intelligence. So finding good solutions to problems, more accurate predictions, more creative solutions, those types of things. Let me frame this though as follows. So why is it, why, why should we care so much about diversity? Why is it important? And I wanna, I wanna give sort of begin by thinking of this in sort of the normative lens, right? That it really is the right thing to do. I think normatively that we want to create a society, society where everyone has the opportunity to participate, contribute, and live you know, their best life, to really have a sort of a, a wonderful go. There's also this demographic imperative, right? When you think about the world economy, the US economy, our health system, you know, the United States will be majority minority within you know, 25 years. And yet when you look at places like Alphabet or you look at medical schools, 
we have so we have relatively small numbers of you know minority engineers minority doctors those sorts of things and so what we need to do is we need to make sure that we're not necessarily perfectly reflecting every population every profession but that we are we're a society in which everyone has the opportunity to contribute now you can combine those two things and there's a recent report by the Kellogg foundation where you sort of combine the normative plus the demographic and you realize that if if america is becoming majority minority and if that minority that what will be now be the majority isn't fully participating in the economy we're leaving so much on the table whether you put this in economic terms whether you put this in terms of lifespan whether you put this in terms of patents the work by lisa cook shows what you're doing is we're just not as a society going to be able to sort of do all we could do if we if we're not inclusive what i want to talk to you today about and have a conversation about is how does diversity link to actually being a more innovative society coming up with better solutions to the problems we face and better sort of ideas around the challenges that we face and the core thread to what i talked about is going to be this is that diversity improves performance on complex tasks if what you're doing is a relatively simple task if you're you know chopping down trees or packing boxes or something like that right then there isn't this sort of like magical thing that happens when you get diverse people in a room there there isn't any bonus that's going to be um created but if what you're doing is something that's really complex then you're going to see that diversity really is a form of talent so when i say diversity though i want to distinguish between two types of diversity i want to distinguish between identity diversity things like race gender class socioeconomic status those sorts of things and cognitive diversity which is how we think so in the, the one column here, we've got these sort of standard diversity notions, gender, race, age, sexual orientation, ethnicity, that sort of thing. And on the other side, I've got these more cognitive notions, information, knowledge, heuristics, representations, causal models, those sorts of things. What I want to have a conversation talking about how each of these things matter and how these things are related. Now, to just get us started, I want to talk about um, this notion of sort of, you know, sort of cultural logics, right? So when you think about how do i think about a problem we might think as scientists that we're objective but the fact is if and dan um there's some wonderful work on this by um by psychologists generally that like the ideas we generate there's a wonderful book called the enigma of reason the ideas we generate tend to be things that are in our own self-interest or in lauren valentino's work from the cultures that we're from and what makes ideas actually rational or objective is being out there in the community and sort of having to confront other people's cultural logics or other people's individual sort of ways of looking at the world. And so rather than think of us as sort of sitting down, hard chair, bright light and thinking rationally, instead we generate ideas that are like self, in our self-interest for whatever reason, like towards our skill set, parts of our culture. And the way we achieve rationality is by confronting other people in other cultures. So let me talk then about this notion of sort of cognitive diversity and how it plays out. So the first thing we want to think about purely scientifically, if you look at the data, what you see is huge numbers increases in the amount of interdisciplinary research, right? So the percentage of papers that have citations from other types of disciplines, right? Outside of their same specialty has gone from like 20% up to, you know, 40, 50% in most disciplines. If you look at something, a particular field, like this is a, a, project, a project I was sort of tangentially involved in by the foresight group out of England. And this is a mapping of the causes of obesity. And so what you see here, each one of these boxes is a different thing. It could be like, you know, epigenetic phenomena, it could be diet, it could be exercise, it could be lack of sidewalks, right? It could be your sort of fundamental level of metabolism, these sorts of things. And if you dig in closely, if you look in the lower right hand corner, you see the different colors of these boxes are different academic disciplines. So everything from economics to food science, to sociology, to psychology, and what you've got is all these arrows between these boxes are studies that show causal or correlative relationships between those different areas. So if I go back right to the, this big map, you could think about, does it even make sense to talk about being an expert in obesity? So if I were putting together four people to run a four by 100 meter relay or four people to swim a four by 100 meter relay, I would look for the four individually fastest people. So that's what we think of as ability. I want the most able swimmer, the most able runner. But if I think about trying to solve the challenge of obesity, how do we sort of 
reduce obesity levels in the United States, or in this case, England, there's no race I can have where I could choose the four sort of best obesity scholars, because the thing is there's these eight or nine different disciplines that are all in play. So if I wanna make headway in a problem like this, what I need to do is I need to have, you know, 10, 12 people, all of whom who've studied different areas, have different sort of areas of focus. I need people who understand that interstitial tissue, right? Sort of how one discipline connects to the others. And I also need people who understand the different populations in which the obesity epidemic is taking place. So what I want to think about then, when I think about this, and, and this isn't so much my work, but it's this whole field of collective intelligence, is we want to move away from how Plato thought about this. So Plato, when he thinks about sort of science, says you want to carve nature at its joints. So there's physics, biology, chemistry, these sorts of things. And what you can think of is if you've got a big problem, we just sort of carve it up, right? And each person knows a different segment of it. And that's how we come to collective understanding. What we now know is on these complex problems, and this is where complexity comes in, is you can't carve nature at its joints. You have to understand the tissue that connects those joints. And so if we need to, to achieve collective intelligence, we need our human capacity to both overlap and to be different. And if we look across the academy, we see that that's exactly what happened. So this is all the research papers written in 1960. You see 20,000 um, is the vertical axis here. Most papers were written by either one author or two authors. If you look in 2016, what you see is the vast majority of papers, and notice the scale here is 500,000, so 25 times as large. The vast majority are written by more than five authors. Now, why is that? The reason why is exactly the reason I've been talking about is that teams do better, the problems are complex. No one person can make a breakthrough. And so if you look, whether you look in science and engineering or social science, and use 100 papers as a threshold. You can use other thresholds, but 100 is kind of a focal threshold. You find that team authored papers are four and a half times as likely to be above this threshold, four and a half times. Some of the solo authored papers as well are survey articles. And so if you get rid of those, the numbers would be even worse. But because it's so compelling, we can just kind of let the data speak for itself. If you do a comparison, individuals versus teams at science, there's sort of Three answers, teams win, teams win, teams win, right? What's going on? Well, what you can do is you sort of figure out the following. Teams just are way more innovative. They think of more stuff. There's kind of an inverted U of diversity. No diversity, you don't do very well. More diverse, you do better. But you can be too diverse. And the reason you can be too diverse is if you have, and there's wonderful work by Jonathan Cummings from Duke on this. If I have 16 scholars from 11 schools, and I'm a physicist, or I'm a biologist, and I don't have an MBA, I may have trouble managing that. So where the peak of that inverted U is right now, like seven, eight, nine, that's every year is moving a little bit to the right. So as we get better, that U is gonna move further and further to the right. And eventually it may just be an upward slope in diversity. The key though, is gonna be that people are collaborative and that we can coordinate well. So Brian Uzi, Senator McArgee, Michael Springer, Benjamin Jones, looked again at all of these papers. And what you know, so this is you know, 20 million papers. And what they found is there's only really two things that drive results. One is you want people who published important papers in the past. So there's a, there really is a benefit from ability. So people who've individually written important papers, they're important members of teams. The other thing that really matters is they have this notion of atypical combinations. People who are coming from different disciplines, combining ideas that haven't been combined in the past. So let me give an example. Um, in behavioral economics, you have people taking ideas from neuroscience and combining it to economics, right? So when you combine neuroscience plus economics, those are two different things. It's an atypical combination. You're likely to make a breakthrough. This is some work by a friend of mine, Dashan Wang. Whether you look at 24 million papers, 2.5 million patents, that's every patent ever done, or 26,000 software projects on GitHub, you see the same phenomenon that teams do better than individuals. But here's sort of the really interesting part. Small teams are really innovative. They're disruptive. And it's large teams that, do, that actually sort of develop and carry things out. Because the thing is, the new ideas are interdisciplinary. So you need a small, deeply focused interdisciplinary group to come up with the ideas. Then you need larger interdisciplinary teams to have them follow through. So how exactly do they test this? What you do is you can sort of look at the papers. If I have a paper, and people cite my paper and they cite some of the papers I've thought of, that's just a normal paper. A disrupting paper is if I come up with something entirely new like CRISPR, 
right? So now all of a sudden, everything I cited, right? Nobody's citing that, they're just citing CRISPR. So that you use words like introduce, change, advance, technique, that sort of stuff. A developing paper is one where people cite my paper and the stuff I've cited, but I'm using words like confirm, hypothesis, demonstrate theory, right? This is sort of like standard science applied to a new idea. When you look again at these papers with 100, with 100 citations, one of the things that comes out, and, and it's, this is a fun group to talk to because people are from Texas and Georgia Tech and Washington and Gladstone, hold everything else constant. Again, this is, you know, hold everything else constant and say, let's look at, you know, adding a co-author and just switching the school. So instead of working with someone from Michigan, I switch and I work with someone from Chicago or someone from Texas or someone from Georgia Tech. The odds of me writing one of those papers, holding everything else constant, goes up 12% if I'm running a social science paper and 7% if I'm running a science paper. Why is that? Because they just know different stuff, right? They're reading different things in different journals. So if you take something like, you know, when you think about the Gladstone Institute, right? I was looking through a bunch of Gladstone papers and what's funny is it really should be called like the Gladstone Plus Institute because most of the papers coming out of Gladstone are people from Gladstone and someplace else, like University of California, San Francisco, right in different departments. And so in some sense, you already know this, right? But the thing is we wanna think of that frame more generally, right? So let me explain some logic here about how this works. And I wanna start by talking about predicting. So one of the things we do as science is we try and forecast, right? We try and predict what's gonna happen in the future. So a, one of the most famous stories involving predictions and forecasting is the 1906 West of England fat stock and poultry exhibition. And this is data gathered by Sir Francis Colton. 787 people guessed the weight of a steer. The average guess was 1197 pounds. And the actual weight of the steer was 1198. Now, if you're playing at home, you realize that is not a steer, but close enough, it's a model of a steer. So they're within a pound. Here's the thing, we're scientists. This is an anecdote. There's also anecdotes like the tulip craze in Amsterdam where the crowd got it totally wrong. So what we wanna understand is what's going on to make crowds are, are crowds on average smarter than the people in them in making predictions? The answer is yes. So you can write something called the diversity prediction theorem that says the following. The crowd's error equals the average error minus the diversity. Right, and I'll explain what I mean by diversity and, and error in a second. So what we get here is that the crowd is actually smarter than the average person in it, and the amount by which the crowd is smarter is the diversity. So to write it formally, C is the crowd's prediction. So that's the average, that's the 1198. Theta is the truth, that's the 1197. So how far off is the crowd from the truth? That's equal to one over N, the average error of the people in the crowd. So the crowd is kind of as good as the average person in it. That makes sense. However, it's smarter. And the amount by which it's smarter is the diversity, which is in this case, the variance of the predictions. Now, why am I calling it diversity? Because these are actually realizations. This isn't a data generating process with variation. These are realizations of different models. So these are or different ways of thinking. So this is diversity in how people thought about the weight. And what you get is the amount by which the crowd is better than its average person is exactly equal to the diversity. Logic is totally straightforward. If Tyrone's way of looking at the world makes his estimate too high, my way of looking at the world makes my estimate too low, those differences are gonna kind of cancel out making the crowd more accurate. So if we go back to the data from Galton Steer, crowd was off by 1.4 pounds. So when you square it, it's two, but on average people were off by like 70 pounds. The crowd was also incredibly diverse and that's why you end up getting this wise crowd because they're pretty smart and they're also diverse. This very, very simple formula and you can do more sophisticated versions like the bias variance decomposition theorem from ensemble theory, you'll get the same sort of feel from it, drives home an incredibly important point. If the problem is complex, no one model is going to kind of get it right. There's going to be error. If I want to not make an error, if I want to have small error overall, the way to do that is through diversity, is to bring different models to bear. Let me give a, an example that's going to be, I think, more resonate more with this particular audience. So this is Gonzalo Abacasis, who was a faculty member at the University of Michigan with me, brilliant guy. He's involved in a contest where the Eli Broad Institute at MIT, the Sanger Institute at Harvard, and, and Gonzalo's group at Michigan are trying to identify genes. So on the horizontal axis here, you see the number of alleles that they can look at. And on the vertical axis, um, 
you're seeing the error rate. So as you can look at more alleles, your error rate falls off. Now there's two things to note here that are important. First is if you look at how these individual teams did, I apologize for the ambulance in the background here. Um, the, the Broad Institute took third by a fairly substantial margin. So they don't do as well as the Sanger Institute or Michigan and Michigan actually beats Sanger by a tiny bit. But what's most important then is look at the dark blue line, the sort of royal blue line. That's if you have a two thirds vote. So if you hold a two thirds vote, you do substantially better than any of the three models. Why? Well, it's just like that. It's because of that theorem I just showed you. You've got three models that are roughly about as good. Eli, MIT is not quite as good, but they're all three pretty close. They're also incredibly different because these are, inc these are really sophisticated models by biostatisticians, right? Deep learning models. So there's no way they're the same. And so what you're getting is three really smart groups who are diverse are going to be smarter than any one of the groups. So we sit around and say, who's the best scientist? Who's the best at predicting? There is no one who's best at predicting. The best at predicting typically is going to be the crowd. Same is true if you look at surgeons' diagnoses. You just do a lot better. This is some work um, by some, if I think of it, and the logic here is just sort of so compelling. If I look at like a portfolio, right, what I get is I get that like, you know, I want to spread risk across different things. I'm going to get the mean. But if I look at those surgeons' diagnoses, they said this is sort of a more sophisticated scoring rule. What you get is that the crowd is better than any single surgeon, right? So when you think about predicting, the reason you want a crowd is not risk aversion. The crowd is actually better typically than anyone in it because of the diversity. So here's data from 48,000 predictions by professional economists. The very best economist was 10% better than an average economist. The second best economist was 9% better third best, 9% better, fourth best, 8% better. The crowd of economists, right? In, in each one of these predictions, there was typically about 40, was 22% better. What's just crazy about this, right? So the best economist is 10% better. Second best economist is 9% better. If you just average those two, you do almost 17% better. Why? Because they're different. And so what do you want is you want smart people who think differently. Same is true if you move to sort of softer realm. So Google looked at this, they looked at interviewing people and they used, Google's got pretty good AI. They get, when I was talking to them about this, they were getting 4 million applicants a year. So they hired some people just using the AI. And so let's benchmark that just using the AI, half the people will be above average, half the people will be below average. If they just had one person interview, then the people they hired were 76% likely to be above average. So you get a 26% delta or bonus from one person. Now a person is not smarter than Google's AI. The point is a person is different from Google's AI. And so what you get is the person plus the AI is smarter than the person and it's smarter than the AI because of this diversity. Okay, that's prediction. What else do we do as scientists? We solve problems, right? We try and find solutions to really hard problems. Here's how I got into this space. I was interested in kind of the mathematics of problem solving. So I said, suppose you have a difficult problem, high dimensional, highly nonlinear. Let's create a set of like mathematical or computational problem solvers, right? Who use algorithms to try and solve these things. And let's create teams, right? That try and solve these problems. What you find is a randomly selected team, again, of talented people does better than a team of the very best, right? And the reason why, let me stop for a second and explain this. The reason why is if I create a population of people and then take the very best, they tend to use the same representations because those are the best representations or use the same heuristics because those are the best heuristics. Now, this is a model. Other people constructed other models and found really similar stuff. Here's one I think that's kind of fascinating by Kleinberg and Ragu. Suppose I think of problem solvers as generating distributions of outcomes. So you get your lab group together and people have ideas and they kind of throw them on the table and say, hey, what if we did this? that gives a distribution of outcome. Somebody else, Tyrone says, what if we do this? That gives a distribution of outcomes. If it's the case that you do anything interesting with the ideas that put out there, so you don't just choose the best one or average them, do anything interesting. Oh, let's borrow this from this and combine this. Then there exists no test that you can apply to individuals such that the best team consists of the highest scoring individuals. The reason why is, that like, 
suppose that you said, okay, let's just take the people who on average had the best ideas. Well, the people who had on average had the best ideas might all be neurologists who went to Texas. But if they're all neurologists trained in Texas, their ideas are pretty similar. If I took someone from Georgia Tech who's an engineer, they're gonna have different ideas and you wanna pull out one of those neurologists from Texas and add in one engineer. So there is no test, right? I know if you're working at Texas, Georgia Tech, Gladstone, like I have two sons who just applied to college, it's really hard to get into these places. You've gotta be really talented. You gotta score really highly on tests. But the reality is once we get on a really hard problem, there is no test that you can apply to individuals that give you the best team because the team you want to be diverse. So these sort of results come out and people are like, that just, that's so counter to how we think, because we think in terms of ability and measuring sticks and how smart are you and what's your IQ and what's your SAT score. I used to teach at Caltech, what age did you read The Hobbit at? I read it at four and a half, right? I did, I read it like 19, but yeah, you know, this is how people think, how smart are you? It turns out there isn't even a test for an IQ test. So if you're putting together a team of people to take an IQ test, you would not use an IQ test, it wouldn't work. The reason why is if you look at the graph on the left, there's something called contextual IQ. Within any group of people, my IQ might be 125, but if you want to think about adding me to the group, you don't care about my IQ, you care about what questions do I do well on that other people don't do well on, and what questions don't I do well on relative to other people. So you don't want to add me to the group if I, if I miss the same questions as somebody else, you do want to add me to the group if I can get answers, correct answers to things that other people get wrong, right? Um, so let's then think about identity. So we've talked about cognitive diversity. Let me switch and talk about identity diversity, right? So first things, let's just kind of like recognize the mystery of <laughs> identity diversity right matter. So this is now seven years old, but there was this amazing study showing that if you have all men or all women in your labs, you're gonna get different results if you're working with mice because of the fact that the mice respond to the testosterone for men, right? And so mice just act differently if handled by men than if handled by women. But let's, so just to frame that that way, right? That things we wouldn't have even expect matter could matter. It turns out that like the way that identity matters is so profound and has such a large impact on groups that it's worth unpacking that, right? In a, to the best we can scientifically. So this is Catherine Phillips, who is a co-author of mine in the book, Diversity Bonus, who recently passed away from cancer. And Catherine says, when you look at decades of research across hundreds and hundreds of studies, so this is an interesting sort of meta-analysis. So it's supposed to one study of 24 million papers or two and a half million patents. This is, Catherine did this amazing sort of meta-analysis of like 600 papers on group performance. And what she finds is that identity diverse groups are the most innovative. And she says, you know, it's kind of obvious what, what I just kept on telling you for 30 minutes, <laughs> that cognitive diversity should make you better. Right, but I tried to show you some of the mechanisms. Um, but what's really amazing is that identity diversity does. And why is that? And what you see if you look more closely is that identity diverse groups are the very best. They're also the worst. So if you plot the distribution of groups, homogeneous groups are the land of the B pluses. So if you want to get a B plus, be homogeneous. Diverse groups are the land of the A's and the lands of the B minuses. Now, the thing is, that's not random. The A diverse groups are ones where shared sense of mission, people are inclusive, everybody gets along, and you really work well. If you don't work well together, you're in the B minus land. So the point is we don't wanna play it safe here and just get the Bs, what we wanna do is think about how do we construct these diverse groups that work really well? And why is it? Why does identity diversity matter? Well, one way to think about why identity diversity matters is that identity diversity probably correlates with, not causes, but correlates with cognitive diversity. And we know cognitive diversity gives better outcomes. Here's where it gets tricky. Here's what I did, a, like how I thought about this has completely changed over the last 15, 20 years. I came at this purely mathematically, right? I'm as a mathematical economist at Caltech and I'm thinking about a problem solving economy. So I've got models with information, knowledge, heuristics, representations, causal models, these sorts of things. People are like, so how does identity diversity matter? Now, what I thought when I went into this kind of naively, because this was, I was taught as an undergrad, is that like, well, Maybe women think differently than men. Maybe Asian Americans think differently than Caucasian Americans or African Americans or Latinos. So I was thinking like plucking off one by one, right? Um, each of these identity characteristics. Turns out empirically that's not right. 
turns out what's true is each one of us is a bundle of characteristics. So I'm a 60 year old white guy, Episcopalian, straight, you know, grew up in kind of like hillbilly elegy land, right? And now I live in a bourgeois Ann Arbor or whatever, right? So I'm like this bundle of stuff and that maps to my information, my knowledge, my heuristics, my representations, my causal models. And it does some kind of interesting predictable ways, right? So if you go to Netflix, if you go to Google, if you go to Amazon, they can look at what books I buy, what movies I rent and those sorts of things. And they can back out that I'm a 60 year old white Episcopalian, right? They can just figure that out because of the stuff on the right. Because they can do that, we know the stuff on the left has to matter. So that's the big reason. Second reason, there's huge group effects. People think differently and harder when you're around identity diverse people. So if I'm in a room with people all like me, Sandy Pentland has done nice work on this, other people have done as well. My pulse is lower, I'm calmer, my brain waves are slower, I'm just not thinking as hard. Put me in a room with people different than me, disciplinarily different, identity different, age different, right, from different countries. I'm just thinking harder, right? I'm more on my toes. Go back to those papers. Now this, to be clear, this is a smaller pile of papers. This isn't 24 million papers, it's only 16 million papers because it's just the science papers. So it's web of science data. Hold everything else constant, change the ethnicity of one author, you get a five to 10% increase in the number of citations, five to 10%. Why? Again, same logic, right? Come from a different country, you read different books, you study different papers, you know different things, you apply different metaphors, you think differently. Not only that, if you have identity diverse and ethnically diverse groups, there's growing evidence, again, we always have to be careful with data about people because people change and we get better often. Groupthink tends to correlate with homogeneity. So this is some wonderful work by Sheen Levine, a friend of mine. Um, if you try to create, you can have these experiments where you try and create bubbles in markets. And it turned out this was very easy to do. It's like shooting fish in a barrel, as they say. Well, the reason it was like shooting fish in a barrel is these experiments were done with homogeneous populations, like undergraduates at Purdue, undergraduates at Caltech. So in a homogeneous population, it's really easy to create a bubble. Look at the graph of the right. If you, the homogeneous markets, that's sort of how efficient the market is if everybody's homogeneous in North America. The answer is it's like 5%, which means 95% of the time you can create the bubble. If though you create a diverse set of people in the United States, it's hard to create the bubble. Why is that? Well, because people are thinking harder and paradoxically, we tend not to trust. You know, it's kind of like trust, but verify with a diverse group that actually leads to, again, you challenge the thinking and more honesty, right? Challenge. It's also the case sometimes when a diverse group, we're under stress. And when we think of when do people act unethically, when do we bring out our worst self? It's when we're under stress. So here's where as scientists, as leaders, as managers, it comes challenging. When we get these diverse groups together, the way to really do well is in some sense, minimize the stress right? But also maintain that sort of atmosphere of challenge of thought, right? One recent example, right? This is Dan Ariely. There was a lot of um, bluster about this last week about research on honesty that turns out to like have had bad data. Now, how bad was the data? Really bad. This was supposed to be a histogram of the number of miles that people drove with three-year-old cars. So take all cars that have been driven three years, what's the histogram look like? That should be a bell curve. It was not a bell curve. It turns out it was like uniform random draw on Excel, right? Um, Max Bazin was one of the co-authors was because in this paper, but Max did a different study as part of his paper. Max was like, you know, one, had this paper retracted and Max said, I feel terrible. I asked Dan for the data. Dan said, oh, I'm just too busy. I'm under stress. Look, everything's fine. And because it's like, you know, all people at elite schools will trust each other, they just let it go through. And under normal circumstances, not under stress, or if, if Max wasn't going to give the benefit of the doubt to someone who used to be at MIT just down the road, he probably would have looked at the data and not published this. Okay. Next big point. So identity correlates with cognitive diversity. That's one. You think harder, you're under identity diverse groups. That's two. Three, and this is the big one. Identity drives purpose, right? So this is a, a quote that I've been using for 20 years and unfortunately not become sort of widely used, not because of me, but just because Mary Oliver's career really took off. 
she has this wonderful line called, what do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And what we choose to do with our one wild and precious life is often a function of who we are, right? So this is Garen Wintemute at UC Davis, just a fabulous person, many of you probably know him, who is a doctor, but he's just basically moved towards working on changing handgun laws, right? This is Andrea Barthwell, who moved and started doing work on opioids, right? This is my friend Victor Garcia from Cincinnati Children's, who one day came home from the hospital and said, you know, here's the weird thing. Cincinnati has like the third best or second best children's hospital in the country. It's also the second worst or the third worst place for children in the country. And there's a, probably a reason for both of those, right? The reason it's actually a good hospital is we got so many kids who are under stress, who are getting shot, who are malnourished, right? Who are drinking poisonous water. And he realized as a doctor, he's at the end of the supply chain. There's this thing called Cincinnati. It's just producing sick, sick children for him to cure. And instead, what he should do is get the front of the supply chain. So he's like, how do I do that? Who knows about supply chains? So we partnered with Kroger, right? Which is like the nation's third largest employer. It's a giant grocery store chain and that knows a lot about supply chains. And Kroger and the Urban League in Cincinnati are working together to try and figure out how do we the way we really cure children is not having them show up to Victor's office in the first place. Erica Newman, if you ever see Michigan, I got to put one Michigan person up here um, doing a similar thing with community oriented health in Project Hope. And again, when you give people, I use the phrase keys to the car because I'm a Detroit person, <laughs> give you all the keys to the car, where they choose to drive it is going to be a function of who they are. And this is, gets back to this sort of the original point about increasing demography of the United States, the increasing diversity of that demography, we need to be giving opportunity to control resources to people who understand and care about diverse sets of community if we really do care about health. These are just anecdotes. Let's go to data. This is the American Academy of um, Medical Colleges. If you say, do you want to go serve an underserved community? Blacks, Latinos are much more likely than whites and Asians. University of Michigan where I work, if you say, do you want to go serve the Upper Peninsula, which is like you know, the top part of Michigan way up here above the bridge, Mostly people from the Upper Peninsula want to go serve people in the Upper Peninsula, not as many people from other parts of the country that do. So people want to go serve the communities they're from. If you look at veterinary students and you ask them, do you want to go work in rural areas? You see that a lot of them do early on. But one thing that's interesting is we get a culture rated out of that, right? So what happens is, um, wonderful, uh, the dean at uh, Auburn said, you know, the problem with vet school is that it's kind of like you've got this labradoodle chardonnay culture. We love that phrase, labradoodle chardonnay, where like you come in there and you're like, yeah, I don't want to go work with large animals in Idaho anymore. I'm going to just like, you know, drink white wine in the evening and work with uh, labradoodles. So you've got this culture pushing against that. And that's one of the reasons why you want to make the places people work diverse is to maintain a culture in which people want to go back and serve their community. A way to think about this, I think, that's very useful is to distinguish between problem search, right? What am I going to do? The Mary Oliver question. What am I going to do with my one wild and precious life versus solution search? So the data I showed you before about cognitive diversity, overwhelming evidence that that's useful on solution search. This is speculation my, on my part, primarily. I think where identity diversity has a larger effect is on the problem search. Right, thing, but what is it that we should do? Um, this is uh, Regina Dugan, who used to work at DARPA. And I bring her up because like, she had this sort of DARPA mindset, solve big problems, that sort of stuff. And now we're seeing DARPA H, we're seeing that move to healthcare. She's actually now CEO of something called uh, Welcome Leap, that's trying to sort of take these ideas from collective intelligence, take ideas from DARPA that's really, you know, skunk works, crazy stuff, and apply that to medicine. And what you're seeing is, what she's doing with her one wild and precious life is taking her experience as an engineer at DARPA and moving it to healthcare. I'm gonna pull back again. Remember I talked about these sort of cultural logics. What I decide to do is a function of who I am. That well understood with psychology and sociology, this is the thing we really wanna leverage. So if you think about like um, cicadas, I'm sitting here in Chicago with cicadas everywhere, right? One thing that's interesting is like you can find out like if you're in a place with lots of cicadas, you realize like, well, they're spraying poison on those things. It turns out that the presence of cicadas correlates with child mortality because the more cicadas, more poison, more child health. That's not going to occur to you unless you're sitting in here with me in Chicago, almost unable to listen because it's so loud. OK, let me close up here in this part, the formal part, so we can turn to the conversation, which I hope will be 
um, really sort of generative and talk about some actions really quickly. So for me, the reason I do these seminars is that like, it's great if I write these papers and 40 people read them, or maybe 100 and they make those charts. But um, how do you get these ideas out in the world and change the world in a positive way, right? And so what we know from the science is diversity can improve science, but it's going to take individual actions, it's going to take agency on our part to make that happen. And I think we often think about pipelines. We have committee meetings and we start a program and we have a pipeline also. Molecule by molecule is often how this works. You identify one student, you identify three students, you meet people, you mentor them, you lead them, you find people and you make sure they have the opportunity. So yes, we wanna build the pipeline, but pipelines are filled with molecules of water. We can't forget that. I think if you're leading a lab, leading an institute, just even a leader in your community, it's necessary that it takes um, the right culture to have this work. You can't just sort of bring people in and expect something wonderful to happen. So I, I think about this sort of scientific case for diversity that I'm trying to present. And again, I'm not saying that diversity, oh, all you want is diversity and magic stuff happens when you put diverse people in the room. That's not true. What's true is germane diversity, shared sense of mission, right culture, right, gives you better outcomes. Inside that scientific case on complex problem is the human case. So the person who's bringing that diversity, who's bringing that passion, they have to feel as though um, they're engaged, right? They're encouraged. It has, to, it has to be a place where you think like, I really want to go to work. There's a, one of the things I love about, you know, so my, I was trained as a, a mathematician and game theorist and economist. And two years ago, you know, partly because of this Maxine Hong Kingston sort of mindset, I moved into our business school in order to sort of have, you know, be more front facing, try to be more of a public intellectual. And I love, one of the things I love about business was lots of two by two boxes, right? Here's a wonderful one by uh, Kim Scott. When she thinks that when you think about how do you create the right sort of inclusive workforce, you want to think of two dimensions. You want to think of, am I including people? Do I care about people personally? That's this vertical axis. And am I challenging them directly? Now, there's a danger, especially in the academy, of not moving on that horizontal axis. So if you engage people and you care about them personally, like Scott, I really care about you. Tyrone, I care about you. Adrian, I care about you but I'm not pushing you, I'm not challenging you, I'm not saying bring your ideas to the table. I run the risk of being in that ruinous empathy box where people just feel like, oh yeah, fine, they want me in the room because they want to feel like they're not racist or something. You want to be in this radical candor box. You want to be in a place where when I come to work, when Tyrone comes to work, when Lisa comes to work, when Megan comes to work, that we know people care about us. They want us to do well. They, want, they know we have goals and ambitions and things we'd like to accomplish in our life. And they know, and they also know in order for that to happen, they've got to challenge my ideas, they've got to engage me. If you look at, this is a, again, one particular split study, but there's many studies that look like this. If you benchmark the homogeneous group, and I recognize there's, there's issues with that, right? but let's benchmark as a homogeneous group and ask, how does a, how does a group that's diverse do? What you see is, is if Neither side, if the minority group is unsupportive and the whites are unsupportive, as, the, as you get more racial diversity, you do worse. If you look at the line that's kind of above the, the 100 line, if, if people are both supportive, if both minorities and the majority group, and again, I recognize the problems of sort of breaking things that way, you do better. So the point is, is that there's kind of, it's kind of like force equals mass times acceleration, right? There's an equation that says, you know, if we have more mass or more acceleration, we're going to do better. What the sort of equations say for science is that like scientific breakthroughs are kind of like ability plus or ability times diversity or ability minus or errors are ability minus diversity. so there's this those are the two things we need we need smart talented diverse people but that only works if people bring their whole selves so when i'm presenting this to you know sort of more general audiences i'll say look you've got all these people who think about the world in different ways different life experiences and you're going to bring them into a room here's what is true if when those people get in the room, they don't bring their whole selves, right? They're not challenged. They don't share. They're not sort of teed up in the right way. They don't feel like they belong in the room. They don't feel safe. You're going to be in the B minus land. If though, everybody brings their whole selves, everybody talks equally, everybody feels their ideas are taken seriously, then you're going to do better. That's what the kind of softer side of the evidence shows. So if you have a culture that supports both cognitive and identity diversity, 
you're going to, you know, it's like we like to say here at Ann Arbor, you know, you'll be the leaders in best. You'll do amazing things, not only on the outcome side, not only advancing science, but also in the lives and the hearts and the minds of the people who work in your organization. It is a win win proposition for all of us to work together, all of us be challenged, all of us be supportive, all of us be able to sort of pursue whatever it is we want to pursue in our one wild and beautiful life. Thank you very, very much.